Chapter Six of the Further Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. The Rehabilitation of Larry the Bat. The small French window of the new sanctuary that gave on the dirty little courtyard, which, in turn, paralleled the black and narrow lane with its high board fence, opened cautiously, noiselessly. A dark form slipped silently into the room. The window was closed again. The dilapidated roller shade was drawn down, and, guided by the sense of touch, the rent that gaped across it was carefully pinned together. There was no moon to shine in through the top light and uncharitably disclose the greasy, ragged carpet or the squalor of the room. The dark form, like a shadow, moved across the room to the door, tried the lock, slipped an inner bolt into place, then returned halfway back to the windows and paused by the wall. A match flame spurted through the blackness, and then, hissing as though in protest, the miserable, clogged gas jet blew with air, still leaving the corners of the room dim and murky, grudgingly lighted up its immediate surroundings, and Jimmy Dale, immaculate in evening clothes, stood looking sharply about him. Here and there about the room, upon this article and that, as though fixing its exact and precise location, his glance fell critically. Then he stepped back quickly to the door and knelt by the threshold, the tiny, unobtrusive piece of thread that must break if the door were opened by but that fraction of an inch was still intact. No one, then, had been here since last, as Smarlinghue, the seedy, drug-wrecked artist, he had left the place the day before for, on entering, he had already satisfied himself that the French window had not been tempered with. A hard smile flickered across his lips. It was a grim transition, this, from the luxury, the wealth and refinement of New York's most exclusive club, which he had left but half an hour ago. The smile faded, and he passed his hand a little warily across his eyes. The strain seemed to grow heavier every day, the underworld more prone to suspicion, the police more vigilant, that ominous slogan in which crime and the law for once were one, death to the grey seal, to ring more constantly in his ears. It was becoming more fraught with peril, danger and difficulty than ever before, this dual life he led, and he had thought it all ended, once. That was only a few months ago, when the way had seemed clear for them both, for the toxin and himself. Well, he was here tonight to end it again if he could, by playing perhaps the most desperate game he had ever attempted. He shook his head. It was more than the hazard, the danger and the peril of his dual life that brought the strain. It was the toxin, his love for her, her peril and her danger, the unbearable anxiety and suspense on her account that was never absent from him. And it was that that kept him in the underworld, that had forced him to create again a role in gangland, the role of Smarlinghue, in the hope that he might track her enemies down. She would not help him. If she knew, and she must know, the authors of this new danger that had driven her once more into hiding, she would not tell him. She was afraid. For him. She had said that. She had said that she would fight this out alone, and that she would not could not, whatever the end might be, bring him again into the shadows, throw his life again into the balance. It was her love, pure and selfish, a wondrous love, that had prompted her to this course. He knew that. And yet... But why all this again? His brain was numbed with its incessant dwelling upon it, day after day. Jimmy Dale's hands clenched suddenly. That night, a week ago, when he'd been so nearly caught in the nest, had brought very forcibly upon him the realization that he could not risk any longer a haphazard course of action if he was to be of help to her, for next time his own luck might go out. And so the idea had come, the one single definite mode of attack that lay within his power, and he had used the weak to advantage, and he was ready now. From the first it had seemed almost certain that the danger which threatened her must come from one of two sources, and there was a way to probe one of these to the bottom. 
He did not know who they were, those who remained of the crime club, or where they were. But he knew the magpie, and he knew where the magpie was to be found. And tonight he would know, settling the question once for all, all that the magpie knew. He turned, walked back across the room, and, a few feet along from the door, knelt down close to the wall. An instant later, with the loose section of the baseboard removed, he reached inside and took out a curious assortment of garments which he laid on the floor beside him. They were not Smarlinghue's clothes. They were even more shoddy and disreputable. His brows gathered critically as he surveyed the wretched boots, the mismated socks, the frayed, patched trousers, the greasy flannel shirt, the ragged coat, and the battered, shapeless slouch head. Matched closely enough to the originals to pass without question, gathered from here and there painstakingly, with infinite trouble during the week that had passed, were the clothes of Larry the Bat. It was a dangerous, almost desperate chance, but he too was desperate now. To be caught, even to be seen as Larry the Bat, meant flinging every stake he had in life into the game. More rabid than ever was the cry of the populace for vengeance upon the Grey Seal. More active than ever, combing den and dive, their dragnet spreading from end to end of the city were the efforts of the police to effect the Grey Seal's capture. More like snarling wolves than ever, the blood lust upon them, mad to sink their fangs into the grey seal, were the denizens of the underworld. And populace and police and underworld alike knew Larry the Bat as the grey seal. If he were seen, if he were caught. They had thought that Larry the Bat had perished in the sanctuary fire that night, and that in Larry the Bat had perished the grey seal. But the grey seal had been at work again since then, and, logically enough, there had followed the deduction that, after all, Larry the Bat had in some way escaped. Jimmy Dale began to remove his expensively tailored dress suit. It had made it much easier for him, easier to play the role of Smarlinghue, easier for the Grey Seal to work, that they, the populace, police and underworld, had of late searched only for a character, a character that, in truth, until tonight had literally vanished from the face of the earth a character known as Larry the Bat. But now Larry the Bat was to assume tangible form again, to accept the risk of recognition, to go out amongst those whose one ambition was his destruction, to court his own death, his ruin, the disclosure that Larry the Bat was Jimmy Dale, that Jimmy Dale, the millionaire clubman, a leader in New York society, was therefore the Grey Seal, and with this disclosure drag an honoured name in the mire, be execrated as a felon. It seemed almost the act of a fool. Worse than that, indeed. Even a fool would not invite the blow of a blackjack, the thrust of a knife, of a revolver bullet from the first crook in gangland who recognised him. Even a fool would not voluntarily take the chance of thrusting his head through the door of one of Sing Sing's death cells. And for an instant, fought out with himself times without number, though this had been since he had first conceived the plan, Jimmy Dale hesitated. It was very still in the room. In his hands now he held a bundle of neatly folded clothing, ready to be tucked away in the aperture in the wall. He looked around him unseeingly. Then, suddenly, the square jaw clamped hard, and he stooped, thrust the bundle into the opening, and began rapidly to dress again, as Larry the Bat. If it was the act of a fool, it was even more the act of a coward to shrink from it. It was the one way to force the magpie to lay his cards face up upon the table. It was the magpie who had discovered that Larry the Bat was the grey seal. It was the magpie who had led gangland to batter down the sanctuary doors. It was the magpie who had clamoured the loudest of them all for the grey seal's death. And it was the magpie, therefore, who had reason to fear Larry the Bat, as he would fear no other living thing on earth. And it was upon that which he, Jimmy Dale, counted. 
the psychological effect upon the magpie on finding himself suddenly face to face and in the power of Larry de Bat, with the unhallowed reputation of the Grey Seal that did not stop at murder, to discount any thought in the magpie's mind that the choice between a full confession and death was an idle threat which would not be put into instant execution. Yes, it was simple enough, and sure enough, that part of it. The magpie would tell what he knew under those circumstances, and tell eagerly. But if, after all, the magpie knew nothing... Jimmy Dale snarled contemptuously at himself. Childish. That, of course, was possible, but in that case he would at least have run a false lead to earth, and have eliminated the magpie from any further consideration. Jimmy Dale took out a make-up box from the opening in the wall, and, carrying it with him to the table, propped up a small mirror against a collection of smiling used paint tubes. His fingers were working swiftly now with sure, deft touches, supplying to his face, his neck, his hands and wrists, not the unhealthy pallor of Smarlinghue, but the grimy, unwashed, dirty appearance of Larry the Bat. It was the toss of a coin, heads or tails, whether the magpie was at the bottom of this or not. The magpie knew that Silver Mag had been in the affair that night when Larry the Bat was discovered to be the Grey Seal. The magpie knew that Silver Mag was a pal of Larry the Bat, and therefore, Equally with the Grey Seal, the underworld had passed sentence of death upon her. But did the magpie know that Silver Mag was Marie LaSalle, any more than he knew that Larry the Bat was Jimmy Dale? That was the question, and its answer would be wrung from the magpie's lips tonight. A piece of wax was inserted in each nostril, and behind the lobes of his ears and under his lip. Jimmy Dale stared into the mirror. The vicious, dissolute face of Larry de Bat leered back at him. And then, returning abruptly to the loosened section of the baseboard, he restored the makeup box to its hiding place. He reached inside again and procured a pistol and flashlight, which he stowed away in his pockets. There would be no need tonight for that belt with its compact little kit of burglar's tools. No need for that thin metal box with the grey-coloured adhesive paper seals, the insignia of the grey seal for tonight the grey seal would appear in person. No, wait, that collection of little steel picklocks, and a jimmy, he would need those. He felt for them in one of the pockets of the leather girdle, transferred them to the pocket of his ragged trousers, and slipped the baseboard back into place. And now he stepped to the gas jet, and turned out the light. Then the roller shade was raised, the French window silently opened, silently closed, and Larry the Bat, hugging close against the wall of the building, crept to the fence, and, lifting aside a loose board, passed out into the lane, and from the lane to an empty and drearily lighted cross street. There was no sanctuary now. Who in the underworld would fail to recognize Larry the Bat? He was out in the open, on the fringes of the badlands, where recognition was to be feared from every passer-by, and where, if caught, he would do well and wisely to use his own automatic upon himself. And he must go deeper still, into the heart of gangland, to reach that room in the basement beneath Poker Joe's gambling hell where the magpie lived, or rather burrowed himself away in those hours that were miserly devoted to sleep. But Jimmy Dale knew his east side as no other man in New York knew it, knew it as a man whose life again and again had depended solely upon that knowledge. By lane and alley, by unfrequented streets, now running, now crouched motionless in some dark corner, waiting for footsteps to die away along the pavement before he darted across the street in front of him, Jimmy Dale threaded his way through the east side as through the twistings and turning of some maze, puzzling, grotesque and intricate, but with whose secrets notwithstanding he was intimately familiar. When he paused at last, it was in a backyard, which he had entered by the simple expedient of climbing the fence from the lane behind. A low building loomed up before him, whose windows at first glance were dark, but through whose carefully closed blinds and tightly drawn shutters might still be remarked, if one were sufficiently inquisitive, the faint suffused glow of lights from within. 
Jimmy Dale scarcely glanced at the windows. Poker Joe's at this hour, it must be close to eleven o'clock, he calculated, would be just about settling into its night's swing. He was quite well aware both that the place was lighted and that there were by now perhaps a score of gangland's elite already at the tables, and that the blinds and shades were closed and drawn interested him only in that it safeguarded him without from being seen by anyone from within. But there was another window upon which Jimmy Dale now centred his entire attention, a narrow oblong window, cellar-like, just on a level with the ground, and here there was neither a light nor a drawn shade. He stole across the yard, and, five yards from the wall of the house, dropped down on his hands and knees, and crawled silently forward. Keeping a little to one side, he reached the window, and lay there listening intently. There was no sound, save a low, almost inaudible murmur of voices from the windows above him. Nothing from the direction of that dark, oblong window that he could reach out and touch now. The magpie was presumably not at home. The long, slim, tapering fingers, whose nerves, tingling sensitively at the tips, were as eyes to Jimmy Dale. Those fingers that, to the grey seal, were like some magical open sesame to the most intricate saves and vaults, felt along the window sill, and, from the sill, made a circuit of the sash. The window, he found, was hinged at one side and opened inward, and now, under the pressure of a steel jimmy, inserted between the ledge and the lower portion of the frame, it began to yield. Lying there on the ground, Jimmy Dale, his head close to the opening, listened with strained attention again. He had not made much noise, scarcely any, not enough even to have aroused the magpie if, say, by any chance, the magpie were within, asleep. The sounds from the floor above seemed to be louder now, to reach him more distinctly, but from the basement room itself there was nothing, no sound even of breathing. Satisfied that the room was unoccupied, Jimmy Dale pushed the window wide open and peered in. It was like looking into some dark, cavernous hole, and he could not distinguish a single object. Then his hand slipped into his pocket for his flashlight, and the round, white ray shot downward and around the place. The floor of the room was perhaps five feet below the level of the window sill. To the left, against the wall, was a bed. There was a chair, a table sadly in need of repair, a few garments hanging from nails driven haphazardly into the plaster, and, save for a dirty piece of carpet on the floor, nothing else. The flashlight played slowly around the room. Opposite the window was the door, and suspended from the centre of the ceiling was a single incandescent lamp. With a sort of grim nod of approval, Jimmy Dale snapped off his flashlight, and, turning around, worked himself in through the window, feet first, and dropped silently to the floor. He had only to wait now until the magpie returned, whether it was a question of hours or minutes. Jimmy Dale made his way to the chair and sat down, and again he nodded his head grimly. It was very simple. He had only to wait, and this place, this burrow of the magpies, could not have been improved upon for his purpose. It was eminently suitable, so suitable that there seemed something ironical in the fact that it should have been the magpie who had chosen it. One could commit murder here, and none would be the wiser. And none would be more keenly alive to that than the magpie himself. A threat from the grey seal and these surroundings left nothing to be desired. They were making too much noise above to hear anything in this room below the ground, and the little window afforded an instant means of escape without the slightest danger of discovery. Yes, the magpie not being a fool, would very thoroughly appreciate all this. Time passed. It was a nerve-wracking vigil that Jimmy Dale kept, sitting there in the chair, waiting. It was so dark he could not have seen his hand before his face. And it was silent, in spite of that queer composite sound of voices and shuffling feet and the occasional squeak of chair legs from above a silence that seemed to belong to this miserable hole alone, that seemed immune from all extraneous noises. 
and after a time, in a curious way, the silence seemed to palpitate, to beat upon the eardrums, to grow almost uncanny. His lips tightened a little, and he smiled commiseratingly at himself. His nerves were getting a little too tautly strung, that was all. He was listening too intently for that expected step upon the stair, for the opening of that door he faced. And it was not like him to have an attack of nerves, and especially in view of the fact that his plan, in the simplicity of its execution, did not even warrant anxiety for its success. He had only to remain quiet until the magpie entered and turned on the light, then clap his automatic to the magpie's head. The psychology of fear would do the rest, and yet... What was it? As the minutes dragged along, fight it as he would, a distinct depression, a panicky sort of uneasiness was settling down upon him. The darkness, in a most unpleasant and disconcerting way, seemed to be full of eeriness, of warnings. For perhaps ten minutes he sat there in the chair, silent and motionless, angry, struggling with himself, but his disquietude would not down. Rather, it but grew the stronger, until it took the form of imagining that he was not alone in the room. He scowled contemptuously at himself. There was another psychology than that of fear, the psychology of suggestion. That silence, palpitating in his eardrums, began to whisper, "'You are not alone here. You are not alone. You are not alone.' Was that a sound there outside the door? A step, cautiously approaching? He leant forward tensely. No. His laugh was low, short, furious. No. It was only from above, that sound. Jamie Dale's face hardened. It was childish, this sensation of presence in the room. But it was also unnerving. Why should so unusual a thing happen to him tonight? Was it purely overwrought nerves due to the strain of the peril he ran as Larry the Bat? Or was it intuition? Intuition had never failed him yet. Well, whatever it was, he would put a stop to it. He was here tonight to get the magpie, and nothing should interfere with that. Nothing. He and the magpie would square accounts tonight, and square them once for all. Not alone here in the magpie's den, eh? His flashlight streamed out, and began slowly and deliberately to circle the room. If his brain was so restless and active that it must indulge in fantasies, it could at least be diverted into another channel then. Jimmy Dale strained forward suddenly in his chair. That was a pair of boots there, at the foot of the bed. There was nothing strange in a pair of boots, but these boots were poised most curiously on their heels, with the toes pointing upward. They just barely protruded from the foot of the bed, which accounted for his not having been able to see them from the window when he had flashed his light around. He could not see the upper portions of them even now. And then, under his breath, Jimmy Dale jeered at himself again. True, the boots were in a most peculiar position, but had his nerves reached the state where a pair of boots would throw him into a panic? How logical for someone to be hiding there under the bed! with his feet in plain view. And yet, what held the boots upright like that? The foot of the bed itself? Jammed there, perhaps? Or... Damn it, gritted Jimmy Dale. I'm worse than a child tonight. He rose from his chair, stepped across the room to the foot of the bed, and like a man, dazed, his flashlight playing on the boots, his automatic flung forward in his hand, he stood staring downward, following his flashlight's ray with his eyes. Was he mad? Was his brain now playing him some hideous trick? The boots were not empty. He could see a man's ankles, the bottoms of a town's trousers. But the ankles and the trousers seemed utterly insignificant. On the sole of the right boot was a diamond-shaped, grey-coloured paper seal. His own insignia! THE INSIGNIA OF THE GREY SEAL. For an instant, it might have been, he stood there rigidly, realizing in a sort of ghastly, subconscious way that the man under the bed made no movement, 
made no attempt to evade discovery, made no sound. And then Jimmy Dale stooped quickly and raised one of the other's feet a few inches from the floor. It fell back, a dead weight. Jimmy Dale's jaws were hard clamped. There was devil's work here, some of the magpies, possibly. Every faculty alert now, Jimmy Dale was quietly lifting aside the small iron bed. The magpie was no fool. By underworld and police alike, it would be accepted without questions that the grey seal had held a day of reckoning in store for the magpie. Had the magpie traded on that, to get rid of someone who was in his way, this outstretched inert thing on the floor, and lay it to the door of the grey seal? It was clever, hellish in its cunning and it would appear plausible enough. The grey seal had come here, say, searching for the magpie, and in the darkness had struck another down. Yes, the magpie could get away with that. It would stand to reason that the magpie would not lure a victim to his own den, and... A low cry was on Jimmy Dale's lips. The bed was moved out now, and he was stooping over a man whose head was gruesomely battered above the right temple and back across the skull. The flashlight wavered in his hand as he held it focused on the other's face. It was the magpie. Dead. End of chapter 6